Well, this morning, we are so happy to be able to continue our series on the miracles that Jesus did. How many of you have been blessed so far with this series? It's been wonderful to be able to catch a glimpse again of who Jesus is through all the things He has done. And today, we are going to be visiting a very familiar one in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there with me and let me read for you this beautiful narrative, Mark chapter 4, from verse 35 to 41. Listen to the words of the Lord. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came, a squall came up. In other words, it's a, it's a huge storm uh, with winds and waves and all that. And the waves broke over the, the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Lord, I pray this morning that you open our eyes to behold the wonderful Jesus that we all worship. Lord, I pray that you help us to see afresh who Jesus is and how important He is in our life. And Lord, I pray that this morning You anoint Your servant so that I may deliver Your Word with clarity, simplicity and authority. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This beautiful narrative actually started with a short transitional phrase and the phrase goes like this. That day, that day when evening came, This phrase is so short that it could be easily ignored. But it was very significant, I think, in setting the stage and setting the context for the story that that is about to unfold. So the question to ask is this, what kind of a day was it? What kind of a day was it? The day actually started for Jesus in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. When Jesus, actually what happened was on that day, it started with a fierce confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees who insinuated that Jesus' power to heal actually comes from a demonic source. That Jesus was able to, to cast out demons because of the power of Beelzebub, because of the power of Satan. And, and, and that, that, I think, is a stressful situation. Then on top of that, they also accused him of blasphemy, that he actually blasphemed against God, which is punishable by death. So how stressful is that? That's what Jesus went through. Then to add fuel to the fire, immediately after that, the family of Jesus actually came to try and stop him. Why? Because they thought that Jesus has gone insane. He lost his mind. Now, that is also tension-filled. How many of you agree? Yeah, now you don't just need to fight with the Pharisees, you need to fight with your own family. And then, after dealing with the Pharisees, after dealing with the family, Jesus spent the rest of the day teaching the crowd in parables. And then after telling them all the parables of the kingdom, he needed to take time to unpack the parables for his own disciples. Now, what's my point? My point is this. It has been a busy, stress-filled, emotionally draining day for our Lord Jesus. So by the time evening came, it is very understandable that Jesus would want to take a break. It is time to take a break. And that was a setup. All this was a backdrop that takes us into this amazing miracle that Jesus actually performed on the Sea of Galilee. And this morning, we want to study this miracle from the lens of trying to see what it reveals about our Lord Jesus. See, that's the purpose of our entire series. It's not so much just to study the miracle itself, but really to find out what does all these miracles Jesus performed tell us about who He is. So I want to unveil for you now three very important revelations of Christ or three very important lessons we can learn in the storm. And the three, three things are this. Number one, 
this miracle really reveals to us the humanity of Christ. The humanity of Christ. The first thing to me that this miracle really reveals about Jesus is His humanity. And this is what makes Jesus so relatable to life, so relatable to all of us. By the end of an exhausting day, Jesus needed to withdraw from the crowd, take a break, have a rest. How many of you identify with that? I would too. After a day like this, all I want to do is have some me time. It's about time to withdraw from the crowd. I don't really want to talk to, to anybody by the end of a day like that. You know, and, and that's what Jesus wanted to do. He says, let's go over to the other side. Let's take a break. And by the end of an exhausting day, he wanted to withdraw. In fact, he was so physically tired, the Bible tells us that even when the fierce storm started battering against the boat, it did not wake him up. He was just zonked out. But notice, it was Jesus who actually initiated the break. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35, he says, The day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And then Jesus then took, uh, the disciples then took Jesus into the boat and they crossed the Sea of Galilee. And it really reveals to me the humanity of Christ. Now, why is this revelation of Christ so important? Why is it so critical to us? And I'll tell you why. It's significant because this is what qualifies our Lord Jesus to be our perfect sacrificial lamb. This is what makes him our great high priest. Now, take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. Now, in God's order of creation, we can see from Hebrews chapter 2, in God's order of creation, man was made a little lower than angels. So God created angels, then He created man a little lower than angels. And then came, then what happened was, Jesus then, even though He was God, He put on humanity. How did He put on humanity? He was made a little lower than angels. In other words, He's made man. And then he came to earth as fully man. And Jesus, when he was on earth, he actually lived as a man. He was tempted like us. But the thing is this, the difference is he did not sin. Every one of us came as a man. We were tempted, but we all sinned. But Jesus was different, made a little lower than angels, just like us. He came to the earth, lived like a man. He was tempted like all of us, but he never sinned. And because of that, he was able to go to the cross, shed his sinless blood and redeem us from our sin. Somebody say hallelujah to that. Isn't that true? And because of what Jesus did, today we can sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because of His humanity, it qualifies Him to actually die for us on the cross. See, and on top of that, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, go on to say this, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, and he is able to help those who are being tempted. The humanity of Christ qualifies him to be our merciful, faithful high priest who today stands before the Father in heaven, make atonement on our behalf. And we say amen to that. And Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16, go on to say this. You need to capture this revelation of Christ. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who have ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. 
Hallelujah. Why? Because he was man, just like us. He went through everything. And some of you may be thinking, but Jesus never really sinned, so he can't really understand me. That's not true. You know why? Think of it this way. Let's say this is temptation level one, all the way to level 10. And then after that, you sin. Okay, most of us, level one, level two, sin already. The best, maybe three, four, five, something like that. You know what Jesus did? He went through temptation all the way, right to the end, but he never sinned. Are you with me? You have not even experienced it, man. He went through all temptation, all the way, and he never sinned. That's what makes him a great high priest. He understands at every level of temptation, he's been through it. Maybe you've been tempted in a way that I have not been, so I may not understand you, but Jesus does because he's been through it all. And then he goes on to say this, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we may receive mercy, find grace to help us in times of trouble. Hallelujah. You know, there was a nine-year-old boy named Tommy who was in class. He was about to do his first show and tell using their family pet. You know, so he was waiting for his turn. First time, he was very anxious. He was waiting and waiting. And then suddenly he realized, hey, there's a puddle of water on the floor and his pants is wet. And that's when he suddenly realized, oh my God, I actually wet myself without realizing it. And he was thinking, the moment my classmates find out, I am finished. And as he was anxiously thinking what to do, and he quickly shoot a prayer to Jesus. He said, Lord, help me. This is a crisis. Help me. And didn't know what to do. And just as the teacher was coming towards him when he was about his turn, the guy behind him, by the name of Dave, Dave stood up and then took his bowl of goldfish and was walking past Tommy and then suddenly tripped and spilled a whole bowl of goldfish onto his lap. And then Tommy jumped up pretending to be upset, but actually in his heart, he was going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then the next thing you know, suddenly the table is turned. Everybody jump out trying to help Tommy, send him to the toilet, you know, get him new pants and all of that. And in the meantime, the anger is shifted the ridicule, you know, all the sympathy goes to who? Goes to Tommy. All the ridicule goes to Dave. And say, so how can you do this? Why are you so clumsy? And all of that, Dave just took it all. But at the end of the day, when, when class was dismissed, Tommy went up to Dave because he knew better. He walked up to Dave and he asked Dave, did you do it on purpose? And then Dave said, yeah, I did because I wear my pants before. I understand. <laughs> Got that? What a picture of Jesus, our great high priest. I'm not saying he wet his pants before. I'm saying is, he knows. <laughs> he is fully God, but he's also fully man. And he understands. He understands what you're going through, the temptations that you face, the storms that you go through, Jesus understood. And that brings me, and not only does he understand, here's the good news, he's able to do something about it. And that brings me to my next revelation of Christ. He's not only fully human and empathize with us and understand us, but he is also fully divine. He is fully divine. And that's the second thing. It's the divinity of Christ. This miracle really reveals to us the divinity of Christ. There's an entourage of boats that were sailing across the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't alone. There were others with him, right? It's a very small body of water, by the way, the Sea of Galilee. It's about 13 miles across. If you've ever been to Israel, you'll know. It's about 13 miles across and about 7 miles wide. Okay, or, or 13 miles wide and 7 miles across. And the depth is about 150 feet deep. Now, even though it's a very small body of water, it is 700 feet below sea level because it's one of the lowest uh, area of the world. But they were surrounded at the same time by mountains. Now you picture all this, right? Lowest level, 700 below sea level and surrounded by mountains. You actually have the, you, you actually have a, the conditions that can bring about a perfect storm. 
And I'll tell you why. Because there's warm air. Because it's low. There's warm air over the lake. But there's also cold air coming over the mountain. And when cold air and hot air finds convergence, you, get, you can get a storm within minutes. And I think this was what happened on that day. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 37, the Bible tells us there was a furious storm that came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And I think it must have been a furious storm because some of these disciples were actually very experienced fishermen who knows how to navigate themselves in a storm like this. And this is their area. They understand it. And it must have been quite intense for the disciples to actually fear for their own life. You see, and, and when you think about this scenario, it's so true to life, isn't it? One moment, everything is calm. The next is chaos. One moment is hopeful. It starts out hopeful and then it turns out awful. You ever been to that? You start out rested and then you come out stressed. You see, and, and we all go through moments like that. How many of you have? Right? Everything seems all right in one instance. Next thing, something happened and boom, I'm now in chaos. I'm in a crisis. The storm of life can just hit us without warning. And the disciples suddenly found themselves in a life-threatening crisis. And as the situation intensifies, I think the disciples must be getting increasingly panicky. But in the meantime, what was Jesus doing? The Bible tells us he was asleep, totally fast asleep. He was literally sleeping through the storm. So what did the disciples do? That's very, very telling. What did the disciples do? You know, it has been said that a crisis does not make a man. It only reveals him. And that's true. Crisis don't make a man. It only reveals him. See? And it is in a crisis that we actually see the true colour of people. You want to know, uh, by the way, those of you who are thinking of, you know, marriage and things like that and you're spying out one another, take them for sports and watch how they behave. That will tell you a lot. Because in a sports situation, we are pouring everything out, whether the guy is gracious, whether the guy is competitive, whether the guy is rude or not, it will all come out. It, it, a crisis doesn't make you, it only reveals you for who you are. And, and I think it's, it's really true. And, and it's in the crisis that we see a true colour of a person. Think of it this way. If I bring to you a piece of sponge that is soaked in liquid and you don't know what the liquid is, all you need to do is squeeze it. Because you squeeze it, whatever is inside will come out. See, it's in a squeeze that things begin to unveil itself. It's in a crisis that we see the true colour of a person. And when that crisis hit, the disciples turned to Jesus and Mark chapter 4, verse 38 is very telling. It informs us this. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up and then they said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Suddenly, it's not master, it's not Lord, it's teacher. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? You can almost hear the voice of accusation in their question. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? It's so common, you know, for us, for all of us, to doubt God in a time of crisis. When the storms of life come and we are in the thick of it, whether it's a relational struggle, a financial hardship, a health situation, it is so easy to yield to the confusion of doubt you know, to you, to the pain of abandonment, the cry of fear. And what's inside all begin to spill out. And the disciples turned to Jesus, whom they have journeyed for so, so long, and she turned to them and said, don't you care? And suddenly we forget we serve a God who cares. That you and I actually have a great high priest who loves us, who died for us. The basic instinct of fear takes over, faith disappears. And we all start questioning, where is God now? when I need Him most? Why did God not hear my prayer? Why is God not doing anything to intervene in my situation? Why is He sitting on His hands? Doesn't He know what's happening? Why is He not acting on my behalf? Why is God not showing up for me? Does He even care? And I think many of us can identify with the disciples at this point. The good news I have for you, my friends, is this. Crisis don't just reveal a man for who he is. Crisis is also where we see who Christ really is. 
Crisis don't just review us for who we are. Crisis is also where we see who Christ really is. So when the disciples roused Jesus from his rest, what did Jesus do? That's when the miraculous took over. That's where we see who Christ really is. He's not just fully human. He is also fully divine. And look at verse 39 now. He got up, rebuked the wind, said to the waves, be quiet, be still. And then the wind died down. It was completely calm. And I think here Jesus revealed himself as the almighty creator who has absolute authority over nature, over creation. But what was interesting for me was also the way that Jesus calmed the storm is by rebuking the wind and then speaking to the waves. You notice that? He rebuked the wind, then he spoke to the waves. And I asked myself, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus do that? I mean, wind and waves, you need to understand are inanimate things, right? They got no life of its own like an animal or human being. No, why, why did God talk to inanimate things? Wave, wind and things like that. This could indicate to me that Christ was rebuking and speaking to the forces behind the wind and the waves. I believe he was exercising authority over spiritual forces that are behind this storm. And interestingly, the word that Jesus used for rebuke in Mark chapter 4, verse 39, is the same word that he used for a demon in Mark chapter 1, verse 25. And the word picture you get of Jesus rebuking the, the wind is actually, the word picture is that of expressing strong disapproval of someone so when Jesus stood up and he rebuked the wind and he spoke to the wave, he's, ex he's actually expressing strong disapproval of something or someone to warn. Okay, in other words, to warn. It's kind of like you walk into my house and then my dog started barking at you and terrifying you. So when, that, when I had enough of it, what do I do? I turned to my dog and I said, that's enough. Quiet. Then the dog... Crawl into and go, you know, put a tail under his, his, his knee, the legs, and then crawl under the table. That's the picture you get. I'm unhappy with this whole thing and I rebuke it, stopped it. See, and that's the picture you get of the wind and the waves then coming down. Now, this could mean that the storm could be something that the kingdom of darkness is trying to use to try and destroy Jesus and his disciples. And this is not surprising to me because Satan has done that before. Like in Job chapter 1, verse 16. You know, while Jesus was speaking, another messenger, this is a story of, uh, of Job. While, while, Job was, while, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God, which is actually referring to a lightning storm. They, they see lightning as uh, uh, something that God sent uh, from heaven and burn up the sheep and the servant. And I'm the only one escaped to tell you. And you know the story of Job, how Satan tested, uh, how God allowed Satan to, to test Job right? To check whether his heart is really sincere towards God. And then so what happened was, lightning fell and then destroyed Job's possession. So that's something that happened in Job 1 verse 16. And then in verse 19, it goes on to say, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them and they're all dead. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Now his children are also destroyed. Because of what? A mighty wind that came. And we all know from the context of the book of Job that it was Satan and his forces that are out to destroy, that are out to test Job. But the good news I have for you is this. Jesus actually has authority over every power of the enemy. Our Lord Jesus has authority over every forces of darkness. Whatever the devil sent to us, he has the authority over it. See, and in Job's case, God allowed it to happen. Okay, but doesn't mean that every time Satan sends something against us, we, have, we just have to take it and accept it. No, I think we take a stand against it. And that's what God has enabled us to do. And he has authority and power over every power of the enemy. Now, the Apostle Paul tell us this. Listen to this and let it build your faith. Ephesians 1, verse 19 to 23. Listen to what Jesus, uh, Paul said here. The, that power is the same 
as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and then what? Seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realm, far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under His feet, whose feet? Under Jesus' feet, and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Paul tells us here that God raised Jesus from the dead and then what? Exalted Him to the right hand of the Father. And today, where is Jesus? Jesus is actually seated at the right hand of the Father, far above every rule and authority, over every power and dominion, over every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And not only that, God has placed everything under His feet. Every authority, every power, every satanic forces, all under His feet. Now, Jesus is fully human, but yet fully divine. And He has authority over all things in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. And the best news is this. Not only has Jesus, Jesus being raised to sit in heavenly places. But Ephesians 2, verse 6 and 7, don't miss this. It tells us this. And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So church, listen to me. Where is Jesus today? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, far above every principalities and power. But where is the church today? We have been raised to sit with Christ in heavenly places. In other words, if the forces of darkness are under Jesus' feet, guess what? They are also under our feet. Because in Christ, we have authority over every power and authority in Jesus' name. If Christ is above all principalities and powers, so are we. And that's why Paul is able to say in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. See, and the, get the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, so here's my point. Whether this storm was a satanic attack or not, the outcome is clear. Jesus Christ is fully divine. And He has absolute authority over creation and every power of the enemy. So whether it's the forces of nature or the forces of darkness, Jesus is sovereignly and divinely in control. Jesus reigns. And we are reigning with Him in heavenly places. And we all say, Amen to that. Not your neighbour and say, He's talking about you. Come on. Yeah? You need to capture this. Capture this. Jesus, fully human, He empathized with us, but He's fully divine. He has authority over everything and we are seated with Him. And in Christ, so are we. And because that is the case, the humanity of Christ, the divinity of Christ, it brings us to the last thing I want to share with you. It's the dependability of Christ. Because He is for who He is. He is so dependable. It's the dependability of Christ. By this time, by the time we get to this point, the sea is calm already. The rescue is done. The need is already met. It is time now to unpack the discipleship lesson for His people. So Jesus turned to His disciples now and then He asked them this poignant question in Mark 4.40. He said to His disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I think that's a question Jesus is asking every one of us. Why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? It's a very telling question because it reveals the fact that they were afraid and they were faithless. And the way that the question was asked informed us that they should not be afraid. It's a rhetorical question. They should not be afraid. They should be more faithful. Why? Because of what Jesus already imparted to them prior to this incident. They should know better. 
Why? Because Jesus already taught them about the parables of the kingdom. He already performed many miracles of healing prior to this. He already set people free from all kinds of demonic oppression. And he's turning to them and saying, hey, don't you already know who I am? Have you not seen what I can do? Do you still not believe in me? Why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? Have I not proven that I'm always dependable? So whether you are on the mountain or you are going through the valley, I am with you in good times or bad. You can trust me, rely on me, have faith in Jesus. That's the challenge for every one of us today. I know, I understand that we like Jesus, we also, we're human. Okay, there are things that we go through in life, but we cannot forget that we are also divine because we've been born again by the Holy Spirit of God. We are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. That we, we are not normal human beings now. We've got more than that. We've got the Holy Spirit in us and we can be faithful people. We can depend on this great high priest. And that's the challenge. And, and this is where the rubber meets the road. And here's my, here's my burden for you this morning. Here's where the rubber meets the road. At the end of the day, it boils down to what? Something which I would call your storm theology. Can I introduce to you? What is your storm theology? In other words, um, when the storms of life come along, who do we believe our God really is? That's your theology in a storm. Okay, because during good times, we have a certain, you know, certain belief about God. But when the storms come, what is your storm theology? When times get really hard, when the storms of life come, who do you believe our God is? When a crisis comes, who do we really believe is in control? When the storms come, do we live by faith or do we revert back to fear? Storms don't define us, okay? They only reveal who we are. See? And in, a time, in times when storms come, can we still truly sing that Sunday school song that we all grow up with? With Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. When we go sailing home. Remember that? Sailing, sailing home. Sailing, sailing home. With Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. When we go sailing home. You know, easy to sing. But when the storm really come, do you actually believe that Christ is in that vessel? That He is actually here with me? Can we still depend on Him? Can we put our total dependency in Jesus when the storm of life comes? That is your storm theology. Okay? Never mind what you tell me is your theology and your understanding of God. Biblically, you know, based on your Bible study, but the real challenge is when the storm comes. What's your storm theology? That's the challenge. I'll close this morning with an inspiring story, true story of a lady called Annie Johnson Flynn. She's a beautiful hymn writer, but her story is stormy. But her storm theology is so good. I want to tell you what it is. Anne Johnson Flynn lost her parents very early in life. So if you're an orphan, what it is. By the grace of God, she was adopted by a godly family, the Flynn family, who was, and they were Baptists, and she was raised in a Baptist home. But from a young age, she developed chronic arthritis. And to make matters worse, even when she was still a young girl, she lost her adoptive parents as well. She ended up having to fend for herself. Her condition became so bad that she was wheelchair bound uh, by the time she was in her 20s and 30s. She became incontinent, was bedridden. She was in such pain 
that she had to be propped up. You know, the bio, biographers tell us she was in such pain. She had to be propped up with seven big pillows all around her just to help her cope. But through it all, here's a beautiful thing. Ann Johnson Flynn had a storm theology that says, God's grace is sufficient for me and His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And through it all, her faith in God's sovereignty, her faith in God's goodness and grace never wavered. And she found her solace by writing hymns and poems. That's how she found her solace. A publisher happened to come across her writing and decided to put it, put it into a book and publish it. And as a result, that brought her financial relief. And God actually used her poems and hymns to connect her to the wider body of Christ. Those hymns that are written out of her pain ended up ministering to people across the ages right up to today. On September 8, 1932, Anne Johnson Flynn passed on to glory. And when her doctor, just before she died, her doctor asked her if she had anything to say. You know, as he was giving her that pain relief jab, he asked her, do you have anything to say? And her last words were this. She said, I have nothing to say. It's all right. And I thought about it. And a few minutes later, she went, went home to be with the Saviour that she loved and served so well. In a life that seems to be all wrong, she received grace and strength to be able to say, it's all right. And I thought, wow. Her storm theology actually was captured in one of her most famous poems that she wrote. The poem was entitled, He Giveth More Grace. Let me read that poem for you. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labours increase. To added affliction, He added His mercy. To multiply trials, He multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed and the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundary, known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth, He giveth, and He giveth again. What a life. It's a life that is built on the revelation of the humanity of Christ that assures us that we have a God who is our great high priest. He knows our weaknesses, and He invites us to His throne of grace to receive help in times of trouble. He's also the, the great, the powerful, authoritative, divine Christ that reminds us He has total, absolute authority for all of creation, including the forces of darkness who are now under our feet. And because He is who He is, we are reminded this morning to depend on Him the dependability of Christ such that we can count on Him in all circumstances, good times or bad, happy times or sad, He never fails. And we can put our complete trust in Him. This morning, if you are here, whether you're here at City Campus, online, and you are going through the storms of life, whatever it may be, I want you to know you are coming to a great high priest this morning. A priest a great high priest who understands you, understand the struggle that you go through. He, he empathizes with you. But more than that, He can do something about it. He is a God who has authority over every principalities and powers. And He is the God who created you. And He is here to meet with you. And you can depend on Him. Good times, bad times, mountain, valley, calm or not, and my storm theology must remain the same. My God is dependable. Amen. And we can come to Him. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that You come and remind us again who You are. You are the great God who come to steal the storms of our life. You are the great God who is fully human, who understands us, empathizes with us, becoming our great high priest. 
you are also the fully divine God, the deity who sits and rule in heaven with all the forces of darkness under your feet. And we thank you that you brought us to sit with you in heavenly places. And because of this, we have authority too over every powers of darkness. And I thank you, Lord, that you are the fully dependable God that we can come to this morning. So come and minister to us, we pray. In Jesus' name.